Mila. Oh, I miss you so much. Yes. I mean, we talked before, so. I know. <laughs> it's never enough. Hi, everyone. This is Lila. Hello. And uh, still a uh, sunset in Paris, so it's going to get darker and darker, but I will put lamps and stuff, so. Maybe you'll have to show us that view of the Eiffel Tower later. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> Now, because I'm not in Paris and you are, I wanted to feel a little bit more like I was in Paris. So I have with me something a little bit French. Ooh. <laughs> Yay, so now I feel like I'm there with you. This barely fits on my giant head, by the way, but I'm making it work. <laughs> you may recognize this from a certain photo shoot. Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Cute. Well, yay. Thank you so much for joining me on the second ever Flow and Tell. I am so excited for people to be able to get to know you better because in my personal opinion, I think that you are such an inspiration to so many people. And uh, can everyone give little hearts on the screen? I'm still learning how the live works here, but I think people can give little hearts. They can ask questions and I encourage people to ask questions throughout the chat if they have any. Yes, so, I let you in charge of the questions and everything, so. I will. Awesome. So, Leela, I want to get started with the question that, of course, everyone asks, every hooper, of course, but you have to answer it because some people are just getting to know you, and that is, I want to hear your origin story. I want to hear about how you got started hooping and um, how long ago, that whole story. So, give it to me. <laughs> Okay, so the whole story is 10 years, so I will try to make it short, but uh, <laughs> I discovered hooping, so 10 years ago, in a festival. It's a kind of like Burning Man, uh, very, very, very small Burning Man in Spain, in Europe, and there were English girls, they were hooping, mainly on body with a really big hoop, and I was just like mesmerized. It was the first time I would ever see um yeah hula hoop or ever like juggling fire i was not at all in that scene so i had no idea like the waves and stuff so yeah total discovery and i bought a hoop on uh internet and then i just like started hooping in my bedroom in my backyard and yeah just fell in love with it and then it just uh, escalated so quickly because it was so new in france that uh, people wanted to have classes, small performances. So actually my like normal story with the hoop was very short and I started uh, like super fast to go on performing and teaching. Yeah, that's so awesome. So do you remember when you got your first hoop? What can you tell us about your very first hoop? Yes, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I don't have it anymore, but uh, my really first hoop was like this really big uh, black tube, uh, like thick uh, 25, uh, one inch, milli uh, sorry, 25 millimeters, one inch, yep. <laughs> and uh, thick. And uh, it was like 40 inches diameter, super big. It was black and green and yeah, super big, but uh, I was in love with shoulder hooping. And I mean, 10 years ago, it was mainly what we saw on YouTube Uh, like all those tutorials were duck outs and shoulders and yeah. on body. Yeah. And it's cool because I actually see so much of that in your style today, like the shoulder hooping, the body hooping. So it's amazing. Like the tricks that you start with kind of can just integrate into your flow and be, become a staple. So yeah, I think, it, I mean, I'm very lucky to have started with a big hoop because it gave me a lot of confidence on, uh, on body and shoulders and be able to move and dance with it. It really, really helped me for like being on stage and being moving from one side to another and just like on body, um, like pirouettes and turning. It really helped developing my uh, like performing style or hoop style. And I still love kind of like... Uh, bigger, medium-sized hoops. I'm not so much into the whole like small hoops uh, stuff. I love to watch them, but it's too fast for me. I really like this more like slow and sensual uh, type of movement. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I can also see when you perform and you're using like the, you know, the bigger hoops, you still put a lot of power into your movement. So it's really fun to watch. Now, do you remember some of the first um, like people that you saw online hooping that sort of helped guide you, like maybe tutorials you watched or how did you learn when you first started? Okay, so I was in uh, my first year, I was in a little city in Switzerland. So I knew nobody uh, over there and I was watching, I remember I was obsessed by one girl who was a uh, hoop charmer. Charmer? Hoop charmer. Oh, cool. I think she's from like San Diego. Okay. She had like, I mean, she had the typical like Burning Man style with the fluffy boots <laughs> and bikinis and stuff. And I was just like obsessed by all of her videos, like the music, all the style and of course Babs Babs for the Babs Robinson for the tutorials helped a lot and uh, yeah mainly those two people watching all of their videos <laughs> right I know I watched Babs too I, I always just loved when she said slow motion <laughs> that was my favorite part <laughs> well that's awesome so in France when you like back in the day when you started hooping in France you mentioned that people were looking for classes do you feel like that um, you sort of helped start like a French community? Can you talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So as I said, when I started, I was in Switzerland because I was studying there. So I came back to Paris after a year of uh, hula hooping and I met one girl who was living not so far away. Uh, I mean, there were other hoopers, but more like circus style. There were yes. people in the circus, uh, maybe fire community who were already doing hooping, but not that type of uh, hoop dance and flow. Mm -hmm. So with this uh, friend, we started uh, a kind of like gathering and we were going into parks, with the hula hoops and music and just like bring people in. All my uh, community from all the Burning Man events came in too and started hula hooping and just like, gather and gather and at one point I think I knew all the hoopers of uh, Paris and uh, but now I mean there's a lot of hoopers that I, <laughs> I don't know who they are maybe they don't know who I am and I mean that's fine and I'm so happy to see more and more hoopers in France it's really cool yeah um, now you mentioned that there were some people who were circus style and not really the style you were doing can you explain to hoopers who maybe you're new and maybe they don't quite understand the difference in what like circus style is and flow style or dance style. Okay. So I don't really make a difference in the style. Rather than saying circus style, I would say they come from a circus background. Mm -hmm. So they uh, encountered the hoop more as a circus um, accessory and uh, doing maybe looking for uh, like multi-hooping manipulation of the hoop, more juggling um, based. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, for me, when I discovered hoop dance, it was more movement and dancing. This is why I like to say hoop dance because it's more dance uh, based and it was more just like single hooping. And I thought at the time, circus hooping was more uh, targeting uh, multiples like two yeah. three four five hoops and i love i love both styles and i think they both have a very different um approach and goals so yeah i love them both yeah and i i can tell because you're very you're very good at both of them and it looks like you dedicate a lot of time to both styles which is really cool now, I want to hear a little bit about this Chupa Hoop situation. Tell me a little bit about how you got your name and maybe just the story of like when you realized, wow, like I am a performer, like I have a performance name. Let's talk about that. Okay. So I have a very weird relationship with my name right now because I chose it so long ago. And sometimes I'm like, do I really want to keep Lila Chupa Hoops, you know, because I mean, I, I was, I was 22, I think. So I was really young and uh, Lila is actually my second name. So my first name is Margot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so yeah, Lila is my second name. Uh, and at the time I was working 
So I didn't really want to kind of blend uh, all my activities. So I decided to take another name for my hooping stuff and like videos. And the Chupa Hoops is actually a play on words on the lollipop Chupa Chups. And uh, I don't, I don't really like lollipops anyway. But uh, everybody always gift me lollipops, you know, uh, for events and stuff. But I'm not a big fan of lollipops. But I keep them. So I keep them in a little box, and I have all those like Chupa Chups from uh, different friends. And I, I even have a student. No, she's not even a student. A girl from New Caledonia. She gifted me a towel, like a huge towel, a Chupa Chups towel. She sent it by the post. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a thoughtful gift. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just a, a very f fun and cute name I chose for the burlesque uh, scene because I started mm -hmm. in burlesque and I had no intention to be... Uh, like a professional or doing circus or whatever. I just wanted to have fun on stage yeah. and doing like very, very small shows. So I just chose the most uh, cute little thing. And uh, yeah, I don't know if it reflects who I am anymore, but I still enjoy like wearing flowers and wearing pink and purple. So, I mean, I guess it still fits me. <laughs> It does. I, I always associate you with the color purple and with the color red. Both those colors are how I associate you. And yeah. also the flowers, the flower shorts, the flower in the hair. It's actually really hard to love this like red and black and like dark style because I used to wear a lot of uh, black and be more into like rock style when I was younger. So I have this kind of dark uh, side of me, which is like red and dark and uh and then i have this all like pink and rainbow and this is mainly influenced by the hoop dance community because i was never wearing any pink or whatever or glitter before and uh yeah now i have those two sides and when i have to dress up i'm like ah black <laughs> red, or purple and they don't go together <laughs> <laughs> you you make it work now, okay, you, you mentioned how before hooping, like you weren't really wearing those colors and stuff. I want to hear a little bit more about who Lila was before hooping, including like where you went to school, what you studied. I already know this answer, but I think a lot of people will be really interested to hear. Okay, so I have a master degree in art history. And I studied in the Louvre, in the big museum in Paris. I spent six years they're studying all the um, uh, artistry and uh, more focusing on museum artifacts. So how to um, like to lead a museum and making exhibitions. And we have to choose one specialty. And my specialty was medieval warfare. Uh, so I studied. Uh, <laughs> so I studied arms and armors more more as a. Um, uh, fancy objects, you know, like a uh, work of art, all those like armors and uh, the decorations and things. So that was my specialty. I worked in a few uh, army museums before and my last job, I mean, my last job, my last normal job was, <laughs> at the, <laughs> was in the cathedral uh, Notre Dame de Paris. And I can see her from my window, but uh, oh. she doesn't have proof anymore. So. Right. The fire. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and it was just like a crazy experience because I already started hooping when I was working in the church. And it was just like this crazy double life of uh, working in a church and being a hoop dance burlesque performer. That was a very fun time of my life. <laughs> now, did you ever sneak in and hoop in the, the, the cathedral because that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, you did? did? Oh, <laughs> tell us about that. So uh, I think you can see it. I mean, I don't know if the video is still on, but uh, on my Hooping Idol uh, submi sub submission, submit uh, video, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I did a, a hula hoop clip on the cathedral but they oh asked me God. to remove the video from internet so no really <laughs> oh darn well, I, I, I can post it again but yeah 
Yeah, there you go. Well, I'm sure people would love to see that. Maybe you could put like a little link to that in your stories or something. I would love to see that. That sounds really special. I know last time I was in Paris with you, you took me to a fire jam that was on the river and it was like overlooking the cathedral and it's so beautiful. You live in an awesome, beautiful city. <laughs> it is. I mean, when you can enjoy it, but. <laughs> yes. So wait, studying arms and armor, does that mean that you can watch a show like Game of Thrones and start nitpicking and being like, mm, no, that's not right. Or, oh, they would never have that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do, but that was a really long time ago. So I don't <laughs> really remember everything, but I also understand that in the movie industry, it's not like the realistic uh, costumes that counts. It's more like the wow factor. But, yeah. uh, but Game of Thrones, actually, when I was working in the Army Museum in Paris, we have some armors that inspired uh, the Lannisters armors in the, um, in the show. And I wow. worked with also the consultant of uh, the Lord of the Rings in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an English guy. It was in uh, England, but uh, yeah, it was so interesting to uh, work with those people. So you see, like from the museum and even from the movie industry, they have to like connect and talk, even if yeah. they just make artistic choices. So. Now, do you ever take your inspiration from your old life and, uh, you know, everything you learned in school? Do you ever take inspiration from that and pull it into your hooping or your acts? Mm, uh, let me think. Uh, I don't really know. Uh, I can I think totally see you doing like a medieval act. Oh yeah, maybe maybe I thought about a Joan of Arc type of things. I might have thought about that <laughs> before. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very inspired by all this like uh, medieval fantasy world, but I don't know. I mean, it doesn't really fit with hula hooping. So maybe mm. with fire. I more into doing something uh, like with fire. Yes, I could totally see you doing something with fire with that. Um, that's amazing. Oh, hang on. My video is frozen. Are you still there? Hello. Oh, no. Are you there? Oh, I see you now. Yay. Can you give me a sound check? I don't hear you. Check one, ch I don't hear you. Do you hear me? No, okay, hang on. We're gonna, I'm gonna cut and I'm gonna go live again. This happened to Lisa and I as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're gonna end, everyone hop. And we're back. <laughs> this happened to Lisa and I as well when we did this. So, hi, hi Kelly, hi Hope for Joy. Hi, thanks for coming back. We will be here in just a second. Hi everyone. This is fun, right? I love getting to know her more. And if anyone has any questions, you can just type them in and we will try to get to those as well. Hi, okay, here we go. Here it comes. <laughs> Hi, Lindsay. <laughs> this is great. Hello. Hi, we're back. <laughs> Again. You know, this, this happened to Lisa and I as well. When we tried, the same thing oh, okay. happened, and then we, but it happened very early on, and we just cut and redid it. So, Maybe in the future there's a different platform for this, but for right now, we will just hop right back to it. <laughs> yes. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, you as a performer, because I think that a lot of people who follow you, follow your journey, follow your hooping, they admire you, A, for your original tricks and trick creation, and B, I think they admire you because you are 100% one of the best hoop performers in the world. So I want to start by talking a little bit about your performance life. And let's just start by what inspires you when you're creating acts? Like what are some things that you think about? Like what's your process? Okay. So what is really interesting for me is that most of my acts 
came from a different inspiration. So I made those like those like seven circles of uh, inspirations, and uh, sometimes it's from the music. Sometimes it's a costume, like my tropical act. Typically, I saw the costume in a fair or a sale, and I was like, "Ah, oh, that's so cool! I want that costume." But I mean, how can you hoop in that costume? It's impossible. So I just <laughs> bought it for fifty bucks, you know, and just stayed in my closet. And yeah, and one day I finally decided to do something with it. But uh, yeah, I I would have never thought about doing an act like this. You know, mm -hmm. it's just because I saw the costume somewhere and sometimes it can be a theme for like a show. Uh, my Roxanne act, which I think is the most famous act I did. Uh, it's uh, It came from a, a show, I was performing to a show and I had to represent the futuristic, futuristic era. It's mm -hmm. like a, the theme was history tease. Yeah. And obviously, I wanted something more old, you know, ancient. Yes. But they asked me to do something like in the future with my LED hoop. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And then, you know, you just like saw some uh, documentaries, videos, uh, advices, and then something gets in. Yes. Uh, and be, it can be an emotion. I performed one act for my mom one day. It was just like a one shot but she was the inspiration of the act. So yeah, I like to have very different uh, feeds of in inspiration. And sometimes there's nothing for a long time and something just like, whew, something pops up, so. Yeah, I love that. What is inspiring you currently? Uh, <laughs> not that much. <laughs> We're kind of in an interesting situation here where we have the, the world at our fingertips digitally, but also there's so much going on in our real everyday life that it's hard to know where to focus our energy. Mm. You know, I have to say I'm used to be like directed in a way, you know, I need to have like a deadline or something. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm not very good at like create something from scratch. Like I have never done, I mean, almost never done an act just like, oh, I want to do this for myself or something. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh, there is this show coming up or I like this music or like this, there is this hoop convention. I want to do something for, it's always like, I need to do it for something, mm -hmm. but uh, it never came like, just like this for myself. So in this moment where we don't have work, I'm like, I don't know what to do, uh, <laughs> but, um, but you know I have something in mind, so yes. and uh, I'm going to give a little, little uh, sneak peek because it's going to be 10 years that I'm hula hooping and I really wanted to do um, a, a routine. It was for Swoop Convention in October, but it's cancelled, so it's going to be my 11 years uh, hoop act, I guess, yep. and uh, it's about my relationship. <laughs> It's about my relationship with my hula hoop, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with your hoop? Give us some insights. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just like I want to be very conscious about the evolution of my relationship with my hoop. I want to accept the, um, like the high moments and the low moments. It's totally normal uh, to uh, ask yourself some questions and just like reflects on um, the the joy you had uh, when you started, all the achievements, and also maybe the uh, dance side of uh, hula hooping, or like when something doesn't work, or like when you feel like you stepping back. Mm. All those like little feelings I want to put into like a routine. But it's, I mean, it's just an idea. It doesn't mean I want to. I don't want people to understand this. The most important is I feel it, so. Right, yeah. right. No, I, I love that. And um, that's something that I think is great advice for a lot of people who want to create an act is you have to have a reason why, you know? What's your reason why you want to create the act? And for you, it's to showcase the, the journey of yourself with your hoop. And I think a lot of people can relate to that too. Even if they don't understand like every little beat in the act, it's the feeling that they're gonna understand. Yeah. And I think it's the perfect moment for me to work on this one because 
I, I can do whatever I want. You know, I don't have any stage to perform it. So I don't have like the pressure of I need to show this trick or it needs to uh, be accessible for this audience and things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's more like an act for my own like satisfaction. It's also the something we to work uh, on when you are like performing is like you need to do shows for um, like the cabaret audience and then you have shows for the jugglers audience and then you have shows for the hoopers and uh, <laughs> I'm it's impossible for me to do one act that fits everybody like I wish I had the you know the act I can do everywhere yes but uh, I like to kind of do many many different little things so yeah you and I have this conversation quite often about the difference in acts for people who are not hoopers and acts for hoop conventions and the little nuances so can you talk a little bit about what the difference is in your opinion between an act you might present at swoop versus an act you might present to um you know a, a cabaret so first i want to say that it's totally fine to have only one act yes. and um, <laughs> i admire people who pursued the uh, way of create a one unique act and performing performing it everywhere uh, whatever the audience is i find it very admiring and um, maybe if i was more confident i would do it also so but um i kind of like feel this pressure you know when lisa lodi was talking last time you know performing in front of hoopers you have a kind of pressure of showing something new uh, or like because people they see you all the time so they know what you are capable of so you don't want to disappoint them but you're not going to disappoint them anyway and um yeah actually i think performing for cabaret is sometimes safer because people are going to be happy in the end but uh I mean, you, you can go in with a safe choreography, like uh, four hoops on the arms and isolations and things. Uh, you don't need to get uh, like crazy on the tricks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I mean, my most frightening uh, audience will always be the jugglers. And, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if I, if I want to say like, I was lucky enough or I was unlucky enough to perform <laughs> in juggling gala shows. But uh, yeah, that's really hard. Like, um, I always feel like jugglers, they have so high expectations of hooping and they have so um, like l low esteem of hoop dance, which is not really true. I mean, there's a lot of people who love hoopers, but I always grew up when I started in jugglers, they didn't like the flow scene or the flow hearts. So uh, I'm like, if I want to kind of like step into the juggling world, I need to balance, I need to juggle, drum son, and it's annoying. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. Well, the world used to be like very separate and just, I feel like over the past few years, they've started melding more. I mean, there's always been hoop juggling, of course, but the the meshing of the hoop dance with the hoop juggling and I think it's creating this really cool new style and um you're definitely on the forefront of that so you would say I, I, go, yes I, I love the fact that uh, hoopers uh, are actually uh, like uh, blending everything now I love the fact that we are a community of hoop jugglers hoop multi hoopers hoop acro contortion hoopers flow dance, small hoops, big hoops. I love that we can all uh, like hoop together and share our own like artistic uh, uh, good and bad uh, stories and things. I think it's really, really cool. And I don't think you find it uh, so much with the other fields. So I think we are a really good community on that. Oh yeah, hoopers are special. And one thing I really love about the hoop community as well is that when people make a discovery with the hoops, for the most part, they're very excited to share and to teach it. And um, what is something that you feel like is a trick or a series of moves maybe, something that you feel like that you've really been on the front lines of that you love sharing? Um, you mean like some tricks I really like to teach? 
Oh. Yeah, things that maybe you've come up with or some sequences, things that you love to share and people really love to learn from you. Okay. So first, I think that when I post any video is to actually show something. Uh, I really rarely share just like hooping or hoop dancing. I usually just turn on the camera for like, oh, I found this cool trick or I found this like combo or sequence. So I just film it and I want to share it. So I try to always just share something like special mm -hmm. uh, and not just like do always the same things. Uh, but I mean, in the end, I always hoop the same way. <laughs> you know, I just create one trick, film it, post it, and then never do it again. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I think this is what people uh, like uh, from my videos and ask the most is all those like intricate sequences, uh, tricks that they don't see so much mm -hmm. uh, in other videos. And um, yeah, uh, I mean, people, they ask for the hardest stuff. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, I mean, it's so amazing to share those complicated tricks. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's it's really it's nice to share them, but it's not nice to teach them because it's really hard. Even for the teacher, it's hard to teach it. So. Oh, of course. You know, something that I hear and see from hoopers a lot is this phrase of like, I don't know transitions or I can't link my tricks together or whatever. So when when I see you, Leela, I see someone who's very good at, you know, creating transitions, thinking outside the box. So I'm curious what advice you would give to someone who's having those thoughts of, oh, I don't know how to link things together or, or, you know, I don't have flow. Like, what would you tell them? What, what do you do that helps you come up with all of these unique transitions? So, um, how I get those combos is usually by just letting myself go with music and uh, like this kind of flow state. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, if I'm just like standing and thinking about like making tricks, it's not going to come right away. I prefer to work with mistakes, if I can say it like this. Like I dance around, I do stuff, do whatever. And sometimes, you know, just like one mistake or when some, something unexpected happens, and maybe it's just like one second or one little thing. And I'm like, stop. And then I go into this maybe over analysis of uh, what, ca what I can do from here, uh, what I can start uh, just before this trick or something, how I can link it with something else. So um, I, it's, it's a mix of, of the two uh, state of like getting just like dizzy and let the thing happen by naturally. And then I'm like, okay, I need to create something badass with this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's nice to play on the two sides of um, just like hooping, see what happens, and also thinking, analyzing, because a lot of transitions are um, like linked with geometry, movement, like um, what side you're spinning your body to, anti spin, uh, speed. Um, like, how do I want to do it fast, slow? Uh, do I want to go uh, in the same direction of the hoop? Do I want to go in the uh, opposite direction? So when you have all this like vocabulary of movement and possibilities, the planes and the grip and things, you can just like start just taking things and put them together, link them. Yeah. Now, when you, <laughs> when you practice, how much of your practice are you free flowing? How much are you drilling? How long are you practicing? Talk to us about like what a practice session for you is like. Okay. So I don't practice every day. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to. My new apartment now is better, but I used to, I mean, before I couldn't hoop at home, so I would go to a training space in Paris, which is really big. And I would go maybe twice a week. Mm -hmm. I don't practice a lot, I have to say. But because when I go into shows, I feel like I'm still hooping and warming up. So as a training session, I would just do like one or twice a week. And I would only go if I can have four hours or like five hours straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm lazy. I wouldn't like take the metro for one hour 
go to the training space for two hours and then take the metro again for one hour like no i need time because i go there and there's people i socialize so i talk a lot <laughs> and uh I go there, I take my hoop, I always start by just like flowing with music, like not really conditioning, but I just flow, get warmed up, do a few exercises and um, try to see like if I can create something or, but I don't do so many drills. I do drills for my performing stuff, like, uh, like the multi-hooping, I need drills for this. Mm -hmm. But for combos, um, yeah, I like to create combos. I like to have fun, but I'm not so good at drilling them. So, bad Vila. <laughs> I'm but also is, not I, good at drilling because <laughs> drilling isn't as fun, right? <laughs> but I mean, and, and I'm doing drill sessions live on Instagram. What am I, why I say that? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. You know, it's, it's, it's honest. I that is doing drills, which is not true. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I, I mean, I teach a lot. I teach a lot. So teaching actually is a kind of drilling because I have to like show the move and show them over and over. So it's a kind of like drilling session also for me by extension. And because I'm left-handed, when I teach, I teach almost everything in my opposite direction. So it's kind of a forced uh, non-dominant hand right. uh, <laughs> drilling. So, I mean, it's good for me. Yeah, and you know, when you did the Instagram Live where you talked about the drills with the open grip and the fans and the hoops, like, that really, really helped me. And, you know, some of those moves are moves that I already knew how to do, but just hearing how you explain them, I think, is really valuable. Um, so the next time you do one of those, I'm really excited to tune in again. Are you doing another one soon? Yes, I'm Ooh. doing one on Saturday. Oh! Uh, yes! It's this Saturday, and I'm, I'm going to do it about wedges. Uh, I mean, now all the hoop world knows about wedges. Yes. But um, I thought it would be nice to just like do my workshop again about the five tips on how to get better wedges and the different hand catches. Because, I mean, like everybody and myself, we tend to just like do one trick and we don't explore so much around mm -hmm. so i want to give the opportunity to people to remember they can use both hands and they can like catch it here here in different parts of their body and um and always people ask for how i do my wedges in the like elegant way so i'm really <laughs> happy to share it <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't want to say that there's like a non-elegant way of uh, wedges, but uh, I mean, there, I there, there can be, <laughs> it can be not elegant sometimes, I mean, it's okay. And I mean, if, even if you know already how to do wedges, if you are into performing, uh, I think you would really benefit from this class uh, because um, wedgie is not the most uh, nice uh, posture, I mean, uh, wedgie pictures are horrible and things so it's not like <laughs> it's a, true. a trick that makes you look super powerful or like super elegant yes. so I want to give tips on how to make it more like nicer in the posture I will say that when I took your double wedgie class I think at Swoop in 2017 you taught one catch which I won't give away because I'll let you teach it but you taught this one catch that I use all the time now and it was honestly so eye-opening. And I totally agree. If you're watching this and if you're a hooper who's like, oh, I already know how to do wedgies, I might not need to drill them, you definitely should tune into this because Leela has some great, great tips. And I mean, I, I seriously remember some of the tips from that class, and I think about them all the time when I'm doing wedgies. So it was very, very helpful. And it's nice when you can take a move like a wedgie, by the way, if you're watching this and don't know what a wedgie is, it's it's not like a wedgie. <laughs> it's a hoop trick wedgie. <laughs> Show us a wedgie, Leela. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. So, um, so, yeah, it is nice when you can take a trick like that and when you can really just explore. Now, okay, back back to a little bit about trick creation. I'm curious, like, what is one of your most proud, like, trick creations or something that you feel like that, you know, that 
came out of your brain and you're like, I am so proud of this. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, I, th I thought about it quite a, a few times today. And I think my most proud moment are actually when I can land a trick on stage. Mm. It's like, I can do as many tricks as I want uh, in my living room. Mm -hmm. But those like, I have this vivid memory of uh, when I started hooping and on stage, I was just like afraid of putting my leg out of the hoop. You know, just like knee hooping and put your leg out. Oh. And it was like so scary or like doing like a candlestick and rolling backwards. Um, mm. I had never done this on stage and I remember I did it on stage. I was like, it wasn't even planned, but I was like, oh, I feel good now. I'm going to do it. And just, it just worked. And my face was just like, wow, I did it. <laughs> I, it, was just, it was really the, I did it, you know? Yes. And uh, I really love those moments. Or like when you hoop on the music and you just like land the trick perfectly on the beat and mm -hmm. it's just like this very satisfying moment and um but on the trick i think my double wedges are my most proud um wedges all the double section of my Roxanne act um i'm very proud of it because i think it's very unique and i i really found all the combos myself so uh, this is what i'm most proud of and actually today i made a video <gasps> where I look back on twin wedges from 2015, 16, when I was very creative with twin wedges. Uh -huh. And I'm just like looking at the video and I, I'm trying to reproduce those crazy twin wedges that I maybe, you know, I did once, I filmed it and then never again. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it again. And I'm like, uh -huh. how did I even think about that? You know, <laughs> it was really hard. I couldn't anymore and it was really fun and I was like wow four years ago <laughs> what right. doing those crazy things that's so funny but, that you say that because the other day I was actually looking back on some videos of myself from 2016 and I was like how did like where did that come from you know and I and I <laughs> tried to replicate some tricks I had done and, and I couldn't do it so that's interesting I know I, I always kind of joke it's like I peaked in 2016 but I feel like that was <laughs> a very creative year and um total coincidence but that is also the year that we met um yeah it's the year that we met uh 2016, not 15? Oh, yeah, in 16. We, yeah, 16. We met in 16 in uh, mm -hmm. March, I believe, at Gail O'Brien's um, Manchester Hoop Con, Con which was yeah. really fun. Think, and then we went to Bali together. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's a, it's a coincidence. It's just like it's a year where we went to a lot of hoop events. And mm -hmm. I feel more creative when I spend a lot of time around hoopers. Uh, lately, I haven't done like so many hoop events or like I'm not surrounded by inspiration around me. So this is why it's harder to create. But uh, this year, like we went to Manchester, we had the Hoop Dream Retreat and yeah. Tweak. Yes. And Tweak was like a crazy nine days uh, twin uh, uh, week uh, with Emma Kenna. And, yeah. I mean, it really did wonders on my like twin wedgie research and things so th i think this is why it just like for us it was a very creative year as well yeah definitely if if someone is looking to like level up in their hooping i always tell them that really great thing to do is to go to an in-person event or to reach out to someone that inspires them like you and try to book a private lesson because it really helps to like you said have the energy of another hooper there um yeah, and then you can, that's when you start getting inventive. And I mean, how many times have you and I just been like jamming in the same room? And then we're like, oh, you got to see this. Oh, you got to see this. There's definitely some magic there for sure. Now, you also run your own hoop event. And I know, sadly, it's not happening this year because of what's going on. But what's it like running a hoop event? So um, the event is called a rendezvous. Mm -hmm. I run it since 2014, so it's been around six years. Um, yeah, it was supposed to be in April, so it's not going to happen this year. But um, I mean, that's fine. Um, yeah. Maybe it's a good time to 
take a year off and maybe it's time also to find new ideas but yeah it was like um more like a weekend in paris it was not a retreat and i was only taking care of uh, you know building the workshops bringing in teachers but people they would find their own accommodation and things and you taught there so did teach you know there. <laughs> it was amazing yeah i think it's so i mean, I mean of course it's my event i think it's nice yes, but uh, it's great. i think it's nice because uh it really brings the french people together it's mo it's most uh, french people i have to say uh, and a little bit of uh, europeans as well but um, yeah um i mean the french hoopers you know with the language barrier they don't travel so much to other events so for them it's so important to have like one annual events where they can gather yeah. from like one side of France to the other so um it's what i loved about that events is when i see like somebody from the north of France and south of France being happy to join in the middle and it's the only time of the year they're going to see each other yeah. it just like makes my heart uh, melt to provide uh this space for them so it's really cool It's such a fun event. I I loved going there. And one thing that I didn't expect until I got there because that was my first time ever in Europe and teaching at that convention, I was like, "Wait, I some people here don't speak English." And that was my first time thinking like, "Wow, I I should have thought about this more when I was planning my workshop." And that was kind of fun to figure that out on the fly and yeah. Now, what yeah. I have to tell to hip teachers is if you don't have like full uh English speaking people mm -hmm. just talk slowly please <laughs> we are a lot of european <laughs> struggling <laughs> especially um, the americans right <laughs> we kind of have a reputation everything fast <laughs> yeah but i mean i learned a lot i mean thanks to hipping and traveling also I uh, improved my English yeah. so it's really cool and also for me going to classes is great because I need to um like learn all the technical words you know yeah. in my classes it's just like always between like swoop and scoop and sweep and flap <laughs> flop yeah like, <laughs> twist turn <laughs> twizzle <laughs> all the things yeah. flourishes i have no idea like flourishes mm -hmm. it's just a concept that is weird to me but it's great i mean in class it's always fun because i always say something funny and everybody's laughing and i don't understand why because i say something so yeah right <laughs> <laughs> now what are some of the cool places that you've gotten to teach and perform like different countries and around because you've traveled the world big time Okay. So, um I haven't traveled a lot for performing. Like I've been performing mainly in France and around. Um but I traveled a lot for teaching. So very quick I'm going to uh like US, uh Australia, yeah. Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh Thailand, mm -hmm. um and then I went to almost uh, all countries in Europe. Uh mainly for hoop events. So I'm so so uh grateful that I was invited in hoop events. Um I did go to a few hoop events uh, as a as a student mm -hmm. and it felt great also. So it's it's just nice uh to take the workshops and uh you know just to be in the back and uh, try to kind of like incorporate it in your own little uh flow mm -hmm. and just like meeting people from different uh cultures different inspirations and things uh it's like you know it's this is the way it joins with my like previous life like i studied history um everywhere in the world like from pre prehistoric uh things to oceania or like uh i don't know like little stones in south america and all those like cultures i studied buddhism and um all the things like internationally for art so being able to meet also the like the actual people the modern world is very very nice and uh yeah i'm really happy about that now 
because you have uh, hired teachers for an event of your own and because you've been asked to teach at so many conventions, I know that a lot of people have asked me in the past, like, how do I teach at international conventions? So what would be your advice to someone who is looking to do something like that in the future as far as maybe um, material or things they could do to like help them along their journey? Okay, so first when I started, it was like years ago. So obviously there was not as many hoopers mm -hmm. on the scene. So I'm sure it was easier for us than it is now. Um, but uh, um, for my event, there's not a lot of uh, spaces, slots for teachers because I try to keep like one or two for French like to give uh, like a scene for French teachers. And uh, for internationals, I try to actually book people I already know. Mm -hmm. And I think this is why I want to tell people who want to teach that they need to go to events. They need to be seen and they need to yeah. um, like interact with people. And I know it's not easy. I'm more like introverted um, myself. And uh, it's not easy to like hang out with the teachers or like uh, going perform at the open stage, but it's the only way people are going to see what you do and see how you teach or like just your vibe. Because when you run an event, um, I mean, you spend money on somebody and uh, there's the skill, which is important, but also the vibe you want to have somebody who is also very responsible. Yeah. All like hoop skills apart. This is, business so you want to have somebody who's like reliable responsible uh, and nice so this is very very important qualities also to teach to an event you need to be a nice person yeah <laughs> but, but also, <laughs> i mean but also, uh, it's true. also very responsible uh, i mean i maybe not for everybody but for me it's like you need to be there on time and uh and prepare well and uh, uh, talk slow for the students you yeah. need to commit to the, <laughs> to the event and uh, yeah but there's a lot of events who ask for like new teachers and you can send videos and um, I will always say think that you want you'd better show that you are a good teacher mm. than yes. maybe a crazy uh, performer or crazy um, uh, like famous Hooper, and I mean, you can be a famous Hooper and a great teacher. I mean, I know a lot of them, but uh, I would say, um, like, as far as my opinion, I look for teachers who are very good teachers. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really glad that you said what you said about going to the event, because in, in my personal opinion, you get out of the community what you put into it. If you want to be a teacher, like you said, like go support other teachers, support other events, go to classes, learn how they teach, make yourself seen, make yourself known. I think that is excellent. Yeah, it's like a, it's also like an investment on yourself. I know mm -hmm. it can cost a lot of money. And uh, when I went to um, Bali, I went as a student and it costed me a lot of money. And uh, it was just a gift for myself. And everything that went after this was just like bam 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 and mm -hmm. getting invited i'm not gonna say it's gonna happen to everybody of course not but um yeah you have to make it happen in a way and uh, going to events is always a nice experience anyway so we it's like yeah it's an investment you, you're not just like paying for like um receiving something like a, like you eat something you know Mm -hmm. You're paying for like a lifetime investment on your hooping, uh, like personal path or something. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Now, because you're a teacher, I was wondering if you could teach me a little trick. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yay. And yes, of course. If you're watching at home, maybe you can follow along too. So how many hoops yeah. do I need? Just one hoop. Okay. And uh, if we have time, I can show you like a double version. Ooh. Of course, it's going to be a wedgie. Ah, <laughs> yay. All right. I'm going to try to. You're not going to see my face. I know. Oh. People are going to see all my laundry. But you know what? It's, it's real. Okay. It's real laundry. Real talk. It's fine. Okay. 
So I don't know if you've done this one before, but it's one of my recent uh, like new catches with wedges. And it's a, a little bit of a, a sneak peek that what I'm gonna do also on the live. Okay. So I'm just gonna show it to you. And uh, there's a lot of different variations, but I thought this variation, you would like it very much. So I will just demonstrate it first. So it's this. And then going into a crossed arm mandala. I love it. Could you see it? Yes, I could. Yes. I love that. It's um, a really interesting catch. It's an interesting catch because um, it's like an, you don't uh, grab it in your hands first. So you have a free hand. So it's very good for double wedges. Mm. So I'm going to start, you can just start into your wedgie position and you want to do it in your dominant hand, uh, dominant side. So I'm left-handed. So I start on my left side. Mm -hmm. And when you're going to push the hoop, what you want to do is to kind of like hug the hoop. So I'm going to show it. When you push it with your thigh and it goes up like this, you kind of want to grab the hoop in your arm. So the um, opposite hand is going to go under and the dominant hand is going to go over. Yes, like this. Okay, exactly like this. So Now what you want to do is you want the hoop to kind of like go over your shoulder here. So you can bring the hoop in. So, um, in. yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what you want to do is actually use your arms to balance the hoop. So once you're here, so the hoop comes on your shoulder, you want to kind of lift the opposite arm, the arm that was in the hoop, you want to lift it up. Otherwise, it might, it might fall from your body. So you want to lift it up and this one down. Okay, so you want to bring the hip on this like, yes, vertical plane here. Mm, nice. Awesome. So you kind of twist your chest to the direction of the hip, yes. What I like to do is after I push my hip, I like to kick it also, uh, kick my, the leg that is pushing the hip to the front. I might just like try to show my legs a little, yeah. It's just to create this nice uh, shape, shape, you know, with the legs, like this. Mm, yes. And twist here. And I'm going to grab the hip on the bottom part with my first hand, yes. And for the trick I want to do, I'm just going to let the hip fall over my hand and then I can just cross my arms into this crossed arm mandala. Yeah, yes. nice. And um, so, yeah, you can try to connect the two together. So you put your arm in, lift your arm. It's going to like automatically bring the hip vertical, push down, yeah, cross and this. I love yes. that. And obviously, I mean, you can just like from here, you could go into an isolation, uh -huh. all kind of different moves. I did a video with one like, 15 different ways of uh, doing this. So I might like link in my stories, the full, uh, the full post. Wow. And uh, do you want me to show the double version? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I come back. Always two hoops. And if you guys have any questions, you can type them in the question box, I believe. And, uh, oh, I do see a question here from Spun You Too Fast, so I will get to that. Cool. All right. Ready. Okay. So, what I want to do, I mean, you can start like, I usually start with the two hoops in my hands, uh, thumb up, yes, on the side like this, yes. And I'm going to just push the hoop away with the hand that is in the front and bring it under my opposite leg to go into my wedgie. Mm. I don't know if it, that makes sense. It's just because I want to hold the hoop oh. in, my, um, in my first hand. So I, I cannot use this hand to go into my wedgie. So I'm just using the other hand to go into my wedgie position. Yes. Oh, so I would do the opposite. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. Maybe you would do it the other way. It depends. Which, so you pass the hoop under the leg to go into your wedgie. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm with you. Yes. Okay. So you hold. I mean, if you. Okay. So if you do your wedgie with the left leg, you have a resting hoop in your left hand, and uh, because you need that arm to go into the hoop. Yes. And if you push your hoop with the right leg, you want to hold the resting hoop in your right hand. Got it. Right. Yep. Yes. So you're gonna hold this hoop like a little bit over because you don't want it to like touch the hoop down. Mm -hmm. You're gonna bring your wedgie up and as you lift the hoop up, you're gonna put your hand in and grab with this hoop. Oh! It's actually to go into an ocho grip. Yeah. So yeah, that was a little bit quick because I mean, you have to find a way to get in, but just like do whatever you want for the start, go into your wedgie position, and then you can like, you can try to find your own entrance to this. But yeah, just kick the wedgie up. And as you bring your arm down, you're gonna grab it with the two hands, with the hand, sorry, the two hips in one hand into ocho. Oh, I love that. And then of course, from the ocho grip, you could transition into so many things. So that's awesome. Thank you. I, I have a video on this one. So sorry if my explanation was a little bit quick. No, that's but I, great. I always, I always post the like slow-mo of the trick. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I totally got it. That was awesome. And I'm definitely going to play with this after we get off the chat. And then I'll probably nerd out and send you some videos and be like, oh, what about this? What about this? Like we That's the whole do. thing about um, twin wedges is like, if you know as many hand catches uh, as possible, it's going to be really, really useful when you have another hoop in one hand, because sometimes it's, it's in this hand, sometimes it's in this hand. Yes. So you need to be able, or like, maybe sometimes you have two hoops in the two hands. <laughs> How do you lock it with your legs and your head? Yes. So yeah, it's really good uh, practice. You know, you gave me a really good piece of advice one time. And I don't even know if you were meaning to give the advice. I think we were just chatting, but you were mentioning how anytime you're doing a trick and you notice that you have a free hand, that's the opportunity to add another hoop or a couple hoops in that hand. And that's really something I use all the time when I'm in that process of um, trying to think outside the box or creating. So that was really solid advice you gave me. Thank you. Um, I have just a few more questions uh, before <laughs> we sign off here and one, just a fun question. I want to know if you've had any like crazy or embarrassing or whatever on stage moments, something that maybe, uh, maybe it's a little embarrassing that people wouldn't know about when they see all your glorious videos. Um, okay. So I have this moment when I was performing Roxanne in Spain and I wear this like red, uh, I mean, I used to wear this red bodysuit at the time. And it was uh, in Spain in the summer. It was really, really hot. The stage was burning, like burning my feet as I was performing. That was horrible, honestly. And, um, you know, it's like those type of bodysuits with the, like, uh, snaps. Yes. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. And, so, okay. So I had no tights. Okay. So just the thong and the bodysuit. And as I was performing... I went down like to do foot hooping and I heard the snaps just like <laughs> and then during the performance I heard, I felt like a second one you know like just like and I was like okay so there's only one holding everything together and I had to finish with the box in front of oh my gosh of ch of children wait explain what the box is in case someone doesn't know what the box is so the box is when you have one hoop on the knee, one hoop on the foot, like four hoops everywhere. <laughs> but that was my ending pose <laughs> with only one snap holding the whole costume. And I mean, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> and all the performance, and we were performing three times a day. And all the other performances afterwards, I had like two bodysuits. So I was just wearing the two. <laughs> just in <laughs> case. <laughs> Oh my God, it was just like, just this m moment of, I don't know. Panic. Like, it was scary. 
<laughs> and, and, yes. and the Roxanne character is such this strong, like confident, like like rare character. So I'm just trying to imagine you being like strong, confident. Oh crap! This is gonna bust open in front of all the kids. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Yeah. But it did it did end very well, so that's fine. Yeah, throwing you know, everything, anything. So. Now, next question also about being on stage, which is what is all right, in all your routines? I know you have a lot of very complicated tricks. And, um, and if you haven't watched one of Leela's routines online, go on YouTube after this, look up her, her page, Leela Chupa Hoops, and just watch her routines. They will blow you away. But what is the one trick, one trick that no matter what you always get a little bit nervous to do because it's the most inconsistent on working um wow i would say um i'm very nervous about the um, the first trick i do in an in an act oh so i'm not i'm not gonna pick like one trick I'm always nervous about those like first 30 seconds mm -hmm. because it's the moment where I I would fuck up, you mm -hmm. know, a trick. It's just like no matter what it is, and it can be like a one-handed helicopter. Yeah. I, I dropped on a like a three-bit weave or, or like all those moves I know really well. It's just um, like I, uh, I did one routine. I, I started with a wedgie. I started with the wedgie. I fucked it up, like in it front happens. of dozens of jugglers, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> <laughs> and um, so yeah, it's just like those those first tricks are so um, unsafe to me because my hands are sticky and mm -hmm. things. So this is why I love to start on body, you know, just like starting hooping on my waist, shoulders fine you know mm -hmm. and because i need i need time to get my hands just like um uh, not having this kind of stress uh in my hands yes or uh, awkwardness so yeah i'm not so i'm not gonna pick a trick uh, but uh yeah those like very first 30 seconds are uh, um needs a lot of focus yeah, because it kind of sets the tone, right? So if you mess up in the very beginning, then your headspace has changed for the rest of the routine. But but if anyone can pull it off and act like nothing went wrong, you know, it's definitely you. <laughs> um, yeah, I did I did throw a lot of hoops in the audience in my life. Yeah. So I mean that's fine. If I can go over it, you can also. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and, you know, your routines are very, very challenging. And I, I think, you know, I've posted this online, but one time you and I swapped routines for Swoop and where I learned one of your routines and you learned one of mine. It was really fun. And I will tell you that there is some hard stuff in Leela's routines. And I was so close to getting it all the way, but then in the wedgie, the hoop got caught in my fishnet. And I was like, dang it. <laughs> I was so close. But, yeah, you know, a wedgie – you know, even though it's a trick that you love and you do all the time, anything can happen on stage. So it's good just to laugh it off and just keep on talking. About costumes, when Lisa said last time, like, you need to, like, be very, very conscious about the costume you wear. Because, again, like, at Swoop this last year, I did my tropical act. I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I retaped my hoops. So... Mm -hmm. I, they were like all shiny and new and I put the 3M grip inside and I mean, I'm used to hoop with fishnets. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm so used to it and I have the 3M grip, but because the edge, the outside was very new, it was just like slip, slippery, very slippery on my legs. And I mean, I felt like a beginner, you know, <laughs> I felt like an amateur, <laughs> just like having my hoops falling from my legs and I was like, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I'm sure people still gave you like a huge applause though. Um, someone asked a question. Well, first of all, Hoop Doll says we're both having a wonderful hair day. So thank you, Hoop Doll. Thank you. Um, someone <laughs> asked the question. Today. Oh, what? What was that? I watched it today just for the interview. Oh, just so you... <laughs> perfect. 
I did not, but I, I just curled the front so it would look like I did more than I did. Um, but someone asked the question earlier, how do you not compare yourself to other hoopers? Okay, that's a very interesting question because a couple of days ago I posted about me comparing to other hoopers. <laughs> so, sorry to say this, but I do compare myself to other hoopers and it definitely brings some bad energy in my hoop um, life. Uh, I, I mean, uh, as much as I try to be, I mean, comparing yourself to other hoopers doesn't mean you're not supportive with them you know it's not because i uh, it's just a, it's um it's an issue with yourself i would mm -hmm. say so it's never somebody's fault and even if i say like oh um i'm jealous about this performer i'm jealous it's not jealousy towards the person it's more a reflection of um i would love to achieve this goal mm -hmm. but either I don't have the capacity or maybe I didn't give myself uh, enough means or I didn't work enough. So it's more like a disappointment on myself when I compare myself to others. I'm just like, oh, you, you, if you want to have that body, if you want to have that flexibility, it's, you need to work. And if you don't have it, it's because you didn't work enough. Yeah. So it's, I think if you compare yourself to others, you need to... Um, like you need to do work on yourself and see like do I really want to look like this person do I really want to be as good as this person and is it even possible like we also need to have realistic dreams and we can admire somebody without having to think we want the same uh like the same body the same fame mm -hmm. and I mean fame is so uh I don't know like it's, it's just a concept and you don't know people's life in the internet. So yeah, the, yeah. The, the grass is always greener on the other side and you just have to be happy about what you've done, your journey. Yeah. And yeah, but I think it's a struggle we all go through. I know you do it as well. Of course. And, uh, of course. It's also a good way of motivation, you know, like, um, you know, when I saw uh, Lisa's interview uh, teaching the multi hooping, I was like, she was saying like, yeah, don't turn, don't turn. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, shit, shit, shit. I can't <laughs> hold my split without turning. Bam, next day I drilled all day and now I have my five split without turning. Right. So, wow. You no. Know, wow. So that I, motivated I, you. I, yeah, it really motivated me because I was in a bad mood and I was like, oh, why everybody's just like doing all these crazy tricks and me, I'm always stuck, blah, blah, blah. And no, actually, it was just me holding everything, you know, and you just, I just had to like open the doors. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And it just happened. So, yeah. you know, you just hold yourself back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up one interesting quote that one of my HoopX students said to me in um, HoopX Boulder, Colorado. She said, the grass is greener where you water it. And I really love mm -hmm. that. It's the grass is greener on the other side of the fence or the grass is greener where you put your love and attention. And if you're putting that love and attention and motivation on yourself, then your grass is going to grow. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> That's right. Good. But I really thought it was beautiful. Well, I want to ask you one final question. And um, I didn't get a chance to ask this to Lisa because I just thought of it. And I'm going to start asking this to everyone I talk to. But what do you, Leela, Margot, Leela Chuva Hoops, whatever, you as a person, what do you want your hoop legacy to be? Okay. Um, I think what I want... It, you mean like what you want people to remember from you? Yeah. Or something? Yeah. How do you want to be remembered mm -hmm. in the world of hooping? It feels like I'm 50 years old, but sure. um, <laughs> so I think I want people to remember my authenticity, I would say, like in the way I perform and do my tricks. Um, it's just like pieces of myself. Uh, I don't have any other way of saying it. Um, I love to make those tricks. I love to share them. When I go on stage, 
I don't think I put a mask on. I mean, even if it's like a lot of makeup and costume and it's not how I am in my everyday life, it's still Lila, it's still my smile. I very rarely play another character. I rarely play somebody I'm, I'm not. Like, I don't try to be someone else or something. So I think this is what I want people to remember that um, all those uh, little uh, tricks, uh, moments, uh, like relationships we had through um, like a physical or even through internet, but it always uh, be authentic. So, yes. I think that's a great, awesome message. And yes, you are very authentic. And I think that's something that really attracts everyone to you because they're like, she's unique. She's herself and she's fun to watch and she's exciting and inspiring and all the things. So that's really cool to hear. That's a great, that's a great legacy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me on this. And I hope that everyone listening got to know Leela a little bit better. And um, so Leela, before we leave, tell us uh, what do you have coming up next as far as classes? How can people find you? All that sort of stuff. Okay, so I'm going to try to remember all the links I have to give you, like those little things I talked about. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to remember everything, but I will put in my stories tonight a few extra things. On Saturday, I will give my uh, Wedgie live class, which is all free on Instagram. Uh, I will put the like time depending on the country, just like come in. You can also watch it later. Uh, it's gonna be nice. Um, and obviously I give private classes uh, also in my new living room. So if you want to have like a personal uh, class with me, it's the best time of the year so I can have like a very like nice conversation and like see you and correct you. I'm really happy to share everything I have in stock. Um, yeah, feel free to go and see like my videos and uh, like performing, teaching. Uh, and I also have another account called Lila Chupa Trains and uh, it's more about my other props. So I have like fans and dragon stuff and other props. And I think it's nice also to check because I do, it's um, it's like all bending to, together. Yes. So thank you very much. I didn't have time to see all those uh, like questions. So I will just like look at them uh, later and try to like answer a few more people. And it was lovely to do this. I love to see Morgan also. And uh, we had a long chat before, so yes, <laughs> that's fine. I know. And it's so great to see you. Sister. And I always feel like Morgan is my big sister of uh, in the hoop world. Aww. For me, for me, she's like a sister, really. You're like my and sister too. And we do two size anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you so much, and thank you for being here. And yeah, we will have to do this again sometime. And thanks for the new trick. I'm gonna go play with it. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And I love you, Morgan. I love you too. <laughs> All right, everyone. Bye.